Uh, right, good morning, everyone. Right, good morning. May I have your attention, please? It seems the students have already started their Christmas break. Right, okay. Now, first I would like to tell you what my plan is uh, for the remaining teaching sessions. If you have questions, please ask. And after that, I move on to completing chapter six. So as I said, um, we have a few slides left and some examples from chapter six. So hopefully I finish them uh, today. And next week, I just focus on past examination papers. So solve a few more questions for you. And please bring along your questions and I answer them as well. So I try to solve one or two examples from each chapter. We've got six chapters. Uh, by then, by next week, as soon as you uh, submit your coursework, which the deadline is on uh, Friday, 6 p.m., I will upload uh, a few more examination papers for you, and obviously the, your examination data sheets as well. The, your examination paper has already been approved by the external examiner, so you have the right to have uh, the data sheets, the equations you're going to have during your own examination. So are there any questions to ask? Anything you would like to know? No questions. So first, a brief review of the slides uh, we had uh, last week, and then I continue with chapter six. In a two-dimensional plane stress or plane stress problem, at any point, we have at most a three independent stress components, two normal and one shear. The same as the strain. We've got two components of normal strain components and one a shear strain. The stress is not a vector quantity, it's a tensor quantity or a symmetric matrix, so we cannot treat it like a vector. Once we've got the stress components using the constitutive equations or stress-strain relations, we can find a strain values. So these are the constitutive equations where the strains are written in terms of the stress components. Or if you've got the strain values, similar to the ones you did in, in the lab, if you've got the strain values, then we can calculate the stresses, again using these constitutive equations. For two-dimensional pain stress problems or pain stress problems, if you're dealing with metallic materials, we need a two engineering constants. A Young's, one is Young's modulus and the other one is a Parson ratio. G exists, but it's not an independent engineering constant. Once you've got E and nu, you can find the G value, the shear modulus. So as I said, Stress is not a vector quantity, it's a tensor quantity, it's a symmetric matrix. If we want to transform it from one coordinate system to another coordinate system, we cannot treat it as like vectors. So we need these three equations to convert stresses from one coordinate system to another. We shall explain it to you last week. So we can convert or transform the stress components from one coordinate system to another. But at any point, there are two orthogonal planes or two perpendicular planes which are only subject to normal stresses. They are called a principal planes. The normal to them are called a principal directions and the stresses applied to them are called a principal stresses. So we've got two of them at any point. It means we've got two planes which are only subject to normal stresses. Obviously, one of them is bigger than the other one, and that is called maximum principal stress. And this is the equation for finding the directions of 
principal, principal planes. And these two equations give, all, give us the minimum and maximum principal stresses. So if we've got a plus and minus sign, as I said last week, the plus sign does not give us always the maximum principal stress. Sometimes the negative one gives us the maximum principal stress. So we have two planes on, the, on this slide I showed you. We've got two planes which are only subject to normal stresses. We also have at any point two planes which are subject to maximum shear stresses. They are called planes of minimum and maximum shear stresses. Now, the principal planes are only subject to normal stresses, but the planes of minimum and maximum shear stresses could be subject to normal stress as well. But definitely, the normal stress is less than the maximum principal stress. So this is the equation for finding the directions of the two planes, planes of minimum and maximum shear stresses. And we can easily prove that the plane of maximum shear stress or plane of minimum shear stress bisects the angle between the principal planes. Another way of saying it, that the plane of a maximum a shear stress is at 45 degree, degrees to the principal plane, any of them. So these are the two equations for finding the minimum and maximum shear stresses. Or if you've got sigma 1 and sigma 2, you can use this equation to find the minimum and maximum shear stresses. It's your choice. Majority of the students use this equation but you get the same answer, obviously. Now, I showed you that last week that the summation of the normal stresses at any point is always a constant value. It doesn't matter which coordinate system you select, the summation is at a particular point is always a constant value. It means principal stresses are independent of the selected coordinate system. They do just depend on the loads applied to the structure. So we move on to the next part, which is a Mohs diagram. Now, whatever I showed you at the moment and whatever we did last week, we can use a Mohs diagram or Mohs circle to find the same values. Obviously, when we say Mohs diagram, you have to do it graphically. It means you need a compass and a protractor to find the stress values, minimum, maximum, principal stresses, shear stresses, and so on. So before I move on to the next slide, I just, this is something you already know. So you need this knowledge for understanding Mohs diagram. This is something you learned, I believe, in maybe in A-level or before that. And that's equation representing a circle. So this is the equation for a circle. So if you've got a, a circle in the XY coordinate system, this equation represents any point on the circle, not inside it, not outside it. A and B are the coordinates of the center of the circle, and the coordinates of any point on the circle satisfy this equation, where R is the radius of the circle. This is a common knowledge, you already know it. Now, if the center of the circle is located on the x-axis, then obviously b is equal to zero, and the equation ends up to be this, the one on the right-hand side. So a is non-zero, x-coordinate of the center, and y is b, which is zero, so we end up with this equation. So that is the equation of the circle. Now, we move on to a slide number nine. Whatever I showed you, I reviewed from whatever I covered last week, we can find it graphically using Mohs, a diagram of Mohs circle. Now, if you understand it and the concept behind it, you never forget it. It's life for life. And obviously, those equations, you forget about them after a few years. But you are doing a job in, related, in relation to structural analysis in future, if you're sitting in the corner of your office, you can just use a Mohs diagram to do some stress analysis, and you don't need those equations. 
And it also helps us to, I mean, for you to visualize those equations. So it gives you a better understanding of those equations. So as I said, when you see graphically, you need a compass and you need a protractor to draw a circle and find the values. So this is a typical point in a loaded structure, two-dimensional planar stress or planar strain. <clears throat> and we've got three stress components, two normal and one shear. Now, and if I cut this point or I pass a, po a plane through it, whose normal mixed angle of theta with the x-axis, and these are the two equations we can use to find the normal stress on that plane and the shear stress on that plane. So in this equation, the only variable we have is the orientation of the plane, is the angle of theta. And theta, I repeat, is the angle the normal to the plane makes with the x-axis. The normal stress and shear. Now I'm going to eliminate a theta between these two equations. In that case, I'm going to transfer this term to the left-hand side, a square it, and add it to the square of the second equation. So this is the term which is transferred to the left-hand side and a squared, plus a squared of SS, or the shear stress. Now, sine squared of 2 theta plus cosine squared of Sine squared of 2 theta plus cosine squared of 2 theta is equal to 1. So in that case, we can easily prove that the summation of these two terms is equal to this value. I want you to compare it with the equation I showed you earlier. So if we have a coordinate system, which is Sn is the horizontal axis or the x-axis, and SS is the y-axis, or the, is the vertical axis, then it shows the equation of a circle. So it's x minus a squared plus a y squared is equal to r squared. So this, the square root of this value on the right-hand side is the radius of the circle. This is the x-coordinate of the circle, and y is obviously the center is located on the x-axis. So on the SNSS coordinate system, where SN is the normal stress acting on any plane, and SS is the shear stress acting on any plane, this equation represents a circle. So this radius is the square root of this term, the summation of these two, and the center is this value, sigma x plus sigma y divided by two. Now, how do we draw this circle? As I said, SNSS shows us the normal, SN shows us the normal stress, and S shows us the shear stress. It means it shows us at any, the coordinates of any point on this coordinate system or the stress state of any plane passing through the point with the angle of theta, whose normal makes angle of theta with the x-axis. Now look at this plane here. Plane A is subject to a normal stress of sigma x and a shear stress of a 2xy. Now I'm going to find these coordinates and locate those coordinates of point A on this SNSS coordinate system. So sigma x at the moment is tension, so it's positive. 2xy is anticlockwise. On the Mohs diagram, an anticlockwise shear stress is negative. So I located point A on this SNSS coordinate system. So this is the normal stress, sigma x. The shear stress is anticlockwise, so here it becomes a negative value. So this is the stress state for point, plane A on the XY coordinate system, or SNSS coordinate system. Now we move on to plane B. Plane B is subject to a normal stress of sigma y at the moment is positive because it's tension. Now this is anticlockwise on the Mohs diagram becomes a positive value. So I locate point, 
the stress state of plane B on, the moon, on, the, on this coordinate system. So these two points are located, each one of them is showing us the stress state. One is for plane A and the other one is for plane B. So I'm going to join these two points which are both located on the circle. Obviously where they, the line intersects, the x-axis, is the center of the circle. Now we can draw it now with a compass. So any point at the moment on the circle show, shows the stress state, I mean the coordinates of the point show the stress state of any plane passing through this point here. So at the moment plane A here and plane B here make an angle of 90 degrees with each other. So the angle subtended between these two is 90 degrees. But plane A and B on the Mohs diagram, the angle between them is 180 degrees. And because we used 2 theta here, when it was eliminating theta, the angle was 2 theta. So the angle subtended between two planes in the physical element is half the angle between two planes on the Mohs diagram. So at the moment, this is for us x-axis, B is the y-axis. So this is the coordinate x of the, which is sigma x plus sigma y over 2, which is the x or a coordinate, which I showed you earlier, of center of the circle. Now look at these two points. These two points have no shear components. You can see this is a point which only had normal component, and this also has normal component. So these two must be principal stresses. What was the definition of a principal plane? A plane which has no shear stress acting on it. As you can see, these two have no shear coordinate. The only coordinate they have is normal. So this one must be maximum principal stress, and this must be the minimum shear, uh, minimum principal principal stress. In majority of textbooks, they use sigma 1 for maximum principal stress and sigma 2 for minimum principal stress. But at least some books, they do it the other way around. So at the moment, majority of examples I show you, I use sigma 1 for maximum principal stress. So these two points have no shear coordinates. Now look at these two points. You can see these two points, we have maximum shear coordinate for these two. So these two must be the maximum and minimum shear stresses. And you can see that we have normal stress on these two points, so they have normal coordinates. But definitely the normal coordinates or the normal stresses applied at these two planes are less than the maximum principal stress. Now this is the orientation of the plane of, um, principal plane. If you remember, tangent of 2 theta n was equal to 2xy divided by sigma x minus sigma y. As I said, on the Mohs diagram, the angles between two planes is twice the value of the physical element. So, on here, in order, this is x-axis, in order to reach the principal stress, I need to rotate it for 2 theta n. So here, therefore, if I want to reach to the principal plane, I have to rotate it anticlockwise, so this is going anticlockwise, for 2 theta n to reach to the principal plane. So here I have to rotate it for theta n. And you can see that if I want to reach to the principal planes of maximum and minimum shear stresses, I have to rotate it for 2 theta s. And the angle between these two is 90 degrees. For the physical element, the angle between them, they are at 45 degrees with respect to each other. So this is how we uh, draw Mohs diagram. So as I said, at any point on the Mohs circle, we have the stress state or stress components, normal and shear, of any plane passing through this point. And how did we construct this circle? 
we constructed using these three stress components, sigma x, sigma y, and a 2xy. Any question on slide number nine? Okay. Now, on the next slide, I have written for you, step by step, how to draw the Mohs diagram. So, I'm, I'm not very good at reading from slides, so I just show you how I can um, draw it again on this slide. But if you look, put slides number 10 and 11 look next to each other and just follow the instructions I have written for you step by step, you can easily draw it using a compass uh, in your own time. So this is how we do it. X, Y axis, the X axis is the normal, shows the normal stress, the Y axis shows the shear stress. First we locate the stresses applied on the two planes, two orthogonal planes, A and B. Point A at the moment is subject to a normal stress of a sigma X, which is positive. The shear stress is anticlockwise, so it is negative on the Mohs diagram. So this is point A, the coordinates of plane, stress factor in plane A. Then plane point B, so the sigma Y at the moment is tension positive. This is anticlockwise, so on the Mohs diagram becomes positive. So I'm going to join these two points to find the center of the circle. Now using a compass, I draw the circle. Once I draw it, then you can easily identify the minimum and maximum principal stresses. I can identify the orientation of the principal plane with respect to the x-axis. So x-axis is my physical axis, the one I'm working on, and the x-axis on the Mohs diagram is located here. Yes, please. Uh, do we assume sigma y is bigger than sigma x? No, this is just an example. This is just a random example. I've, I've sh I'm going to show you a good couple of good examples that are different. So this is orientation of the maximum and minimum shear stresses. And you can see here, I have also shown you how to say, for example, at this point, uh, we are after the stress components at an angle of, say, four, 60 degrees. So say theta here is 60 degrees. So on the physical element, and I am rotating this element for 60 degrees, so I end up with the coordinates x double prime, y double, double prime. So this is x-axis here. So I'm going to rotate it for 120 degrees. So on the physical element is 60. 60 multiplied by 2 gives us 120. It is rotating anticlockwise. So I rotate x-axis for 120 to reach x double prime. So you can see here we've got theta and we've got two theta here. So the slide 10 and 11, I've written exactly what you should be doing. It's like cooking instructions. If you just follow it, I'm 100% sure you can draw the circle. Any question? Yes, please. The way, I, um, the way I showed you the equilibrium equations, I mean, what I did for you, I cut, I cut the plane and I looked at the left, I kept the left hand side and removed the right hand side. For the equations I showed you, this is how it works. Now in some books, they remove the left hand side, so when you cut the, that infinitesimal element, you keep the top part and if you remove the left one, then yes, you need to do it other way around. For the way I have written for you the equations, this is how you should draw the circle. Does it answer the question? Yeah, and also like, for example, in like exams, does it always like have the same diagram? Or for example, like yours, it's always like No, no, this is just the values, as, I mean, this is the 
question one of the children asked earlier. It depends on the, obviously, the values of the normal and shear stresses. I'm going to solve a few examples for you. So both of them, for example, are compress compressive. One of them is compression, the other one is zero, for example. So uh, this is just an example to show you the diagrams. No, it doesn't represent anything. It's just an example. But the equations are correct, and the way I'm doing it, you, know, you should follow it. As I said, in some books, you know, when last week I cut the plane with, with a plane, I mean, uh, the element with a plane, I removed the top part of the element, and I wrote the equations for S and SS. In a few books, the majority do these standards. In a few books, they keep the top part, they remove the bottom part, very old ones I've seen that they keep the top part and they write the equations. Obviously, the angles will be different, but the method is whatever I'm showing you here. So just to make, so as I said, if you put a slice at 10 and 11 next to each other and follow the instructions, you easily can draw it in your own time. So I'm going to, for question number three, if you remember, each slide I covered, when I explained principal stress, maximum shear stress, I solved for you different parts of question three. Now, we're going to repeat whatever we did last week, but using a Mohs diagram. So at the moment, we've got a normal stress of 100 megapascal acting in the X direction, and a normal stress of 50 megapascals both of them at the moment is tension, but I have an example later on, which one of them is compression. And we also have a shear stress of 75 megapascals. So we are asked to find the stresses on a plane whose normal mixed angle of, I believe, 60 degrees with the x-axis. We also have the principal stresses. We also have the maximum and minimum shear stresses. So I'm going to draw it for you now. So first, SNSS coordinate system, X for the normal stress, Y for the shear stress. We have a normal stress of, <coughs> I'm sorry. We have a normal stress of, 100 megapascals, which is tension acting on plane A, and a shear stress of 75. So this is a bit similar to what I showed you earlier. So these are the coordinates or stress state of point or plane A on this diagram. Now plane B is subject to a normal stress of 50, which is tensile, and a shear stress of a 75, so this is anti-clockwise, so it becomes a negative on the Mohs diagram, and this is clockwise, it's become positive. So I identified the two points, the coordinates of two planes on the Mohs diagram. Now the next stage is joining these two, and finding the center of the circle. Now I take a compass, Draw the circle. The first thing you see is the, are the coordinates of the principal stresses. So this is the maximum principal stress. So you can see we have no normal stress acting at this point, which is bigger than this. So this is the maximum principal stress of 154, and this is the minimum shear stress of minus 4 megapascals. The maximum shear stress, 79. The minimum is minus 79. You can see 79 is 154 minus minus 4 divided by 2. So for us, this is the x-axis. So this is x-axis on the Mohs diagram. And this is the y-axis on the Mohs diagram. The angle between them is 180 degrees. Here is 90 degrees. Now, point A, in order to reach to the principal plane, we need to rotate it for this angle here. So I can measure it using a protractor. 
and it is going anticlockwise for 72 degrees. So 72 divided by 2 is 36. I rotate it for 36 degrees anticlockwise. Now the next part of the question asks us to find the stresses on a plane whose normal makes angle of 60 degrees with the x-axis. So we have 60 degrees here on the physical element. So if you remember, I rotated this element for 60 degrees. Or the plane to the normal to the plane made 60 degrees with the x-axis. So 60 is here. And this is the x-axis. So 60 multiplied by 2 is 120 degrees. This is 72. So I have to rotate it anticlockwise for 120 degrees. So the coordinates of these two points are the ones I showed you last week. The very first example I solved for you last week. Do you have a question? Oh, oh just rotating. Okay. So here, the coordinates of these points are, one of them is SN, the other one is SS, and the coordinates of this point are S theta and SS. And these are what we did last week. These are the values we found last week. So if you use a graph paper and a compass, you can find the same exact values in your own time. And any question on this example? And I'm going to solve a couple of more examples as soon as I finish all the lecture slides. Yes, please? Of course I can. Shall I go back from the beginning? Um, Which part of it? Um, after, the, after coordinates here. After coordinates. Okay, fine. Yeah. Why not starting from the beginning? Okay. So this is SNSS coordinate system. So we've got plane A, which is subject to a tensile stress of 100 and the shear stress of 75. So this is a positive and this is negative on the SNSS coordinate system. We have a tensile stress of 50 and a shear stress of 75 anticlockwise. Now I join them. So this is x-axis and this is y-axis. This, this is a physical element, x and y. Here, the angle between them is 180. Now, we, the more circle center is definitely located on the x-axis. So this is the center. If I join these two, that is the center of the circle. Now, I have two points of the circle, and I have got the center as well, so I can easily draw the circle. So any point on the circle, not inside it, not outside it, it represents the stress state of any plane passing through the, this point here. So these two must be the maximum and minimum principal stresses. And these two must be minimum and maximum shear stresses. Does it answer question, your question? OK. Now, this is the physical x. This is the most x. Now, in order to reach to this point, I have to rotate it for this angle anticlockwise. So here, the angle is 72. So it must be 36 here. And last week I showed you how to find on a plane whose normal makes angle of 60 degrees. So 60 degrees on the physical element multiplied by 2 gives us 120. So if I want to rotate it here, I have to rotate it 60 degrees anticlockwise. So on the Mohs diagram, I rotate x-axis anticlockwise for 120 degrees. So the coordinates of these two points are the ones we found analytically using the equations I showed you. I believe it's a slide five. Does it answer the question? Okay. So we move on to a slide number 15. I cover slide 15. Yes, please. 
at the very top of the circle, is it the maximum amount of shear stress? Yes. Why point B is not at that point? Because it's at the very top of the element, so it should have this is 75. maximum shear stress. This is 75, this is 79. This is, this is 50 and 75. I've just shown you the, um, the shear stress applied to it. I haven't shown you the X coordinate of it. The X coordinate is sigma X plus sigma Y divided by 2. The, co the shear coordinate of this point is a 75, which is this distance here. This distance is 79, it's about 4 megapascals more than that. Now the thing is here, I haven't shown you the x-coordinate of it, I've only shown you the maximum. I've written 2, 1. Does that answer the question? The x-coordinate of this point here is 100 plus 50, so divide by, it gives you this coordinate here. Does it answer the question? So the, what I've done here, I've only written the value of the shear stress. I haven't written the coordinate. For all the other points, I have shown you the coordinates. For this one, I've written 154, which, which is x coordinate of this point. The y coordinate of this point is 79. I haven't shown you the x coordinate because I was not interested in that. I was interested in maximum and minimum shear stresses. Okay. Yes, please. Could you say it a bit? Uh, which point on the diagram shows us the S theta? S theta, that is a good question. So we had Sn, S theta, and Ss. So when I rotated, so when I rotated the element, on, the, on this side we had Sn and Ss. And on the top side, we have S theta and SS. You remember. Okay. Now, here, this is SN and S the SS are the coordinate of this point. And the S theta and SS are the coordinates of this point here. So this is SN here, and this is SS at this point. So this is SS. This is SN. Now, at this point, we had S theta which is this distance here. It's not very, it is not bad, it's, it's almost to a scale. So this is S theta, which is this X coordinate, and the SS coordinate obviously is negative at this point here, is this value here, SS. So this SS, SS, this distance is SN, and this distance is S theta. Does it answer the question? Okay. Which I've written the values here for you. Any other questions? Now we move on to the next slide. So I cover slide 15 for you because it's stress related. Then I move on to a strain analysis. And that's criteria for yielding. If you remember in chapter one, uh, when I showed you the stress strain curve, for a material which was subject to unidirectional loading, then it said whenever the stress reaches the yield stress of the material and elastic plastic deformation starts, the material has failed. So for a unidirectional loading, we say material has failed whenever a stress reaches the yield stress of the material, or safe, if you're using safety factor, the safe stress. Now, when a, when a component or a structure is subject to a combination of loads, then obviously we cannot use that criterion anymore because we have a, the stress state obviously is not one dimensional. It could be two dimensional, it could be three dimensional one. Now the ones you see at the moment are the most popular one for metallic materials and based on the stress values. We have other criteria which are based on the strain values, based on energy, or for composite, we have many more failure criteria, both based on the stress, not both based on the stress, the strain, or energy. So these are the most common ones used for metallic materials. So as I said, if we've got a component which is subject to unidirectional loading, 
We say it fails whenever stress is equal to the yield of stress. But when we have a combination of loads, what we have to do, we have by inspection to find the point or points within the structure which are highly stressed. And these are the ones we did on Friday afternoon last week. So by inspection, we find a point or a series of points which are highly stressed. Now then, based on these three criteria, which are very popular, we say whether the material has failed or the structure has failed or not. And if it is, we are at the design stage, then we can increase, say, for example, the thickness, the material diameter, or depends on which structure you're analyzing. So the first one is ranking or maximum principal stress theory. So what we do at this position, we find the maximum principal stress, and then we compare it with the yield stress of the material. If it's equal to the yield stress or higher than that, obviously the material has already failed. So we have to redesign whatever we've done. So based on the ranking or maximum principal stress theory, the Whichever inspection point you have, the principal stress in that location must be less than the yield stress of the material. The second criterion is a Tresco or maximum a shear stress theory. So based on this criterion, whenever the maximum a shear stress in that location, I showed you how to find 2-1 and 2-2, maximum and minimum shear stresses. Now, based on Tresco, whenever the maximum shear stress in your inspection, in, in the point you're interested in, is equal to the maximum shear stress on the simple tension, we say the material has failed. So we need to keep 2-1 and 2-2, or absolute of 2-1 and 2-2, less than half the yield stress. But where does this value come from? For normal stress, we say the yield is equal to sigma y. But where does sigma y over 2 comes from? So in simple tension, this is what we have. If you have a bar which is subject to tension, this is the failure stress based on the stress strength curve. Now in this case, if I use this equation for the simple tension, I can find the maximum shear stress in simple tension using this relation. So sigma y at the moment is equal to, this is capital Y, this is sigma y, the stress applied in the y direction is zero. There is no shear stress applied here. So therefore, for simple tension, the maximum shear stresses are plus or minus sigma y over two. So if we get back to the Tresca criterion, whenever maximum shear stress for a component which is subject to co combined loading at any point of it, whenever is equal to the maximum shear stress on the simple tension. And I showed you that in simple tension, the maximum shear stress is half the yield stress. Now we can also find them using Mohs diagram. So this is SNS's curve. I'm going to draw it for this case. On this plane, we only have normal stress of sigma y, which is the yield stress. There is no shear stress applied. So this is the point showing this plane on the Moore's diagram. As you can see, at this plane, on this plane, we only have normal stress, no shear stress. On the top plane, we have not, no stresses at all, neither shear nor normal. So it must be the coordinates of this plane on the SNSS coordinate system. So these are the two points showing the stress values on this plane and this plane. I'm going to join them, and then I'm going to draw the circle. So this is the Moore's diagram for the simple tensile test, a simple tension. Now look at this diagram. We have the maximum and minimum shear stresses at these two locations. And you agree that this is a circle. These two must be plus or minus sigma y over two. So I showed you the maximum shear stress on the simple tension is half the yield stress. 
either analytically or using Moore's diagram. So based on this criterion, whenever maximum shear stress is equal to the maximum shear stress under simple tension, the material has failed. Yes, please. No, no, no. In the, in the light where it says tau 1 and tau 2, you crossed out sigma y being 0. Sigma x equal to sigma y. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, please don't mix up little y with capital Y. This is the yieldless res. So if I show you, that's a valid, good question, actually. So if I just um, show you, so let's use red. So this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, so sigma x here, you agree is equal to sigma x, little x, is equal to the yield, so this is little x, is equal to the yield stress, do you agree? Now sigma y, which is the stress acting on this plane, little y, you agree it's equal to zero? Yeah. Okay. And do we have any shear stresses acting? No. So sigma y is zero. Shear stress, there is nothing. And sigma x is equal to the yield stress of the material. Happy? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is the second criterion. And the final one. As I said, these are the most popular ones, and the last one is for Mises, or equivalent stress theory. And in this um, theory, we say whenever the distortion energy at a point is equal to the distortion energy for simple tension, then the material has failed. So don't worry about whatever I said now. Just whenever the equivalent stress or for Mrs. stress, which is defined by this equation, is equal to the yield stress of the material, we say the material has failed. Now, in the majority of textbooks, they don't give you the why, where does this come from? But as I said, whenever distortion energy at a point is equal to distortion energy in simple tension, which comes from this value, sigma y here, then you end up with this equation here. And whenever you equate this with the yield stress, then the same material has failed. Now, you might say which one of these three shall I use? And I, the answer to that is that it depends on the material. Is it brittle? Is it ductile? And mostly, which type of stress is the material is subject to? Like when we were in uh, chapter two and we were analyzing a thin walled pressure vessel, obviously the a theta coordinate system uh, where uh, the plane, the principal directions. In the theta coordinate system, we had axial stress and we had Hooper stress. We had no other stresses applied, the shear stress. So when we're comparing the Hooper stress with the yield stress, we were using ranking theory. If I was using Tresca, I would have compared uh, the difference between, because two, one is equal to sigma one minus sigma three, or two divided by two. I had to use the difference of the principal stresses. So that Tresca is not good for chapter two. We use ranking theory. Now when we're in chapter four, we can't use a ranking. The component is subject to shear stress. We need to use a Tresca. But the last one is mostly used by academics. They do a lot of experimental analysis. So not all the time, but most of the time, the for Mrs. one agrees with the experimental results and is better than the other two. But again, I can't say it is the best one all, all the time because some industrialists use the first two rather than the third one. But mostly academics use the last one. They do experimental analysis, they compare it with the analytical ones, and most of the time gives us the best result, the form misses one. So any questions in regard to these three criteria? So we have ranking, 
Tresco and four misses. Now let's see what V. So this is the same equation when uh, we are writing it in uh, principal directions. As you can see, the shear stress here is equal to zero. So I've written it in terms of principal stresses rather than stresses. Yes, please. Where it's called a formesis stress. Formesis, I've written it here. It's called equivalent stress as well and effective stress. There are three names for it. Formesis, effective and equivalent. Okay, now we move on to question number three. In question number three, the problem is asking us, this is what we did last week. And I showed you using Moore's diagram as well. Maximum principal stress, minimum principal stress, the maximum and minimum shear stresses, and the full misses stress, 156.12. Now, if the yield stress or safe stress of material, say, is 160 megapascals, the problem is asking us whether the material fails at this position or not. So my question from you, is it going to fail based on the maximum principal stress theory? No? Good. Based on the maximum shear stress theory of Tresca, look at the slide 15, is 79 less than half the this or not? Okay, so it's not failing. Is it failing based on four misses? No. So it does not fail based on any of these three criteria. So if I want to keep it safe, it has to be equal or less than the yield stress or safe stress of the material. So it's nine minutes uh, to 11, eight, eight minutes. So see you in 10 minutes, please. The question is, the shear stress at point B, mm -hmm. I expect it to be the maximum because it is at the furthest way from the center. No, 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 no. you haven't understood the concept, no. So why, why is, why is it?
So this is a so this is a summary of a slides a four, five, and a six. So this is what's considered as a stress analysis and continuum mechanics for two-dimensional problems. So we have a three stress components, two normal and one shear. Once we've got those three components, we can find, excuse me, you three, excuse me, please. So once we've got the three stress components, we can find the normal stress and shear stress acting on any plane passing through this point with normal mixed angular a theta with the x-axis. Or another way of saying it, when we rotate the element for the angle of a theta. The principal stresses, we use these two equations to find the principal stresses, their directions, maximum and minimum shear stresses and their directions. And using the constant equations, we can relate stresses to strains either in the XY coordinate system or in the 1, 2 coordinate system. So in majority of textbooks, they say 1, 2 coordinate system as plain principal plain uh, directions or principal directions. So some books, they don't write it x, y. They write for you directly 1, 2. And when you move on to 1, 2, there are no shear coordinates in that, or shear stresses in that coordinate system. So this is a summary of 4, 5, 6. Now we move on to a slide 12. Stress and strain mathematically behave in a similar way. So whatever I showed you for stress components, I can repeat it for a strain components as well. In majority of textbooks, they do a chapter, very similar equations. They just replace sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy with epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. So mathematically, they behave exactly the same. So I don't think we have time for it. But if we just, as I said, repeat the same equations, replace sigma x with epsilon x, sigma y with epsilon y, and the shear stress with shear strain, you end up with similar equations. So this shows us the normal strain and shear strain on any plane passing through this point with the angle of theta. We can find a principal strains. You can see instead of sigma 1, sigma 2, we've got epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. Obviously, the principal strains happen, occur, on the principal, the planes of the principal stresses. And we could also have maximum shear strains, maximum and minimum shear strains. So you can see everything is the same. I've just changed the symbols from stress to strain. And we can find the relations between principal stresses and the strain using the constant equations. Obviously, we only have two constant equations in the one, two coordinate system. You have no shear strain in one, two. Or you can write principal stresses in terms of principal strains. So this is what we consider a strain analysis. Now, I'm afraid we cannot measure stresses. So when you're in the lab, we cannot measure stresses directly. We can measure strain values using the strain gauges. Once we've got the strain values, these are constant equations, we can find the stress values. That's what you did for your laboratory assignments. And the problem with the strain gauge is that it only gives us a strain in one direction. As this strain gauge, this is a schematic view of the strain gauge. I discussed it briefly in chapter one. It only gives us a strain in the PQ direction. It's not sensitive to any other direction. But based on what I showed you earlier, if you've got to a component which is subject to a combination of loads, at each point we have three strain components, two normal and one shear. So I cannot just use one strain gauge, I need at least three strain gauges to give me these three strain values. So in that case, we need at each point three strain gauges. 
The angle this string you just make with the x, x axis, this, this is the main axis of the typical string gauge, and this angle is usually measured from the x axis in the anti clockwise direction. So the angle is not the angle between the gauges. All of them, if you've got this XY coordinate system as the origin or the global coordinate system for us or for this element, the angle of each one is the angle of PQ with the X axis in the anti clockwise direction. So this is theta 1, this is theta 2, and this is a theta 3. So for a typical two dimensional case, we need at least three gauges because we have three string components. So this is a typical 60 degree strain rosette. So if you combine these three gauges, it is called a strain rosette. So when somebody says, I have a strain rosette, means there is a cluster of three gauges stuck together at different angles. So this is a 45 degree strain rosette. This is the one you use in the lab. There was a 45 on the top. There were, there were different angles at the bottom, but you didn't get the measurements for those. So we had two on the top. We had one at the bottom. We had, in total, there were three string rosettes attached to the tube. But you only got the measurements for the 45 degrees one. But how do we get, when we get these string values, how can we, the string measurements, how do we get the, or we can extract these three values from these measurements? Now, based on what I showed you, there is a relation between the strain in this plane, xy plane, and any other plane. So say we can have a relation between epsilon 1 and epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy, based on what I showed you earlier. So by transformation of one coordinate system to another, we can find a relation between a strain, normal strain, in this gauge, and the original string components. Similar to stresses, we have a relation between the normal stress acting on a plane and the stress on any plane passing through a point and the three original stress components of the matrix. It's exactly the same. So I have a relation between strain in this gauge and the original three string values which I am after. So this is coming from the computer. This is a measurement I have. I have a similar measurement for the second one, so I have, have a relation between epsilon n2 and these three. And again, this is the angle this gauge makes with the x-axis in the anticlockwise, and the third one. So here I've got a three unknowns, and I've got three simultaneous linear equations. By solving these three, I can find the three unknown values of epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy. So epsilon n1, in some, um, they write it as en1, en2, en3, are the measurements coming from the data logger, the DAQ system, the computer, and these are your calculations. Any question on the slide number 13? So we move on to the next slide. So this is the one you used a 45 degree strain reset. And you had three unknown values at each location. So for the 45 degree strain reset, one is located along the x-axis. In your case, was in the longitudinal direction of the tube, or in the axial direction of the tube. The other one is located at 90 degrees, so for, in your case, it was in the transverse direction or circumferential direction of the tube. And one is located at 45 degrees. So this is a 45 degree reset. Now if I use the equation, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so if I use the equation I showed you for a strain transformation, for this, for this string gauge, a theta 1 is equal to 0. The angle PQ, or main axis of the gauge mix, with the x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. So for this one, theta 1 is equal to 0. So for 
The second one, theta is equal to 45 degrees anticlockwise. And for the third one, it's not the angle between these two. Again, the angle with the x-axis in the anticlockwise direction. So this is 90 multiplied by 2 gives us 180 degrees. So the first one gives us epsilon n1, which is epsilon x. Epsilon y is epsilon n2. And epsilon n2 gives us this value. Sorry, epsilon x is equal to epsilon n1. Epsilon y is equal to epsilon n3, this one. And epsilon n2 is a summation of these two divided by 2 plus half of the gamma xy. And if I rearrange this equation, and I end up with this relation here. And this is the equation I was using in my head when I was checking your strain measurements. So the first one is epsilon x for 45 degrees reset. Epsilon n3 is epsilon y. And we, use, we get the value of shear from the middle one using this equation. Any question on slide 14? Okay. So, so let's solve the first part of question six, please. In question number six, using a strain rosette, a 45 degree strain rosette, we've got these three measurements, epsilon n1, epsilon n2, and epsilon n3. In some textbooks, they write that EN1, EN2, and EN3. Now, the problem is asking us to find, whether, to find out whether at this location the material fails or not. So it doesn't ask us to find the stress components, then the strain components, or any of it. It's asking us directly, based on these three measurements, does this component fail at this location or not? Now, the criteria I showed you on page 15, they are based on the stress values, not the strain values. So we need to find the stress values first, and then based on those three criteria, to investigate whether it's going to fail or not. So I have uh, three equations, three simultaneous equations, and three unknowns. I can find epsilon x, epsilon y and gamma xy at this location. This is a not 45 degree reset. So in the exam, you don't need to write all three equations. Write one of them, but write all three angles to get full mark for it. It doesn't matter it's 45, 120 degrees, or 60 degree reset. Write one of the equations to save time, but write all three angles, theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 to get full mark for the question. So here we've got theta 1, which is 0, so I can, or I can directly write epsilon x equal to epsilon n1. The second one, we've got 45 multiplied by 2 gives us 90 degrees. And the third one is 90 degrees multiplied by 2 gives us 180 degrees. So from these three simultaneous equations, I can find epsilon x epsilon y and gamma xy. So I showed you earlier for 45, this is epsilon x, this is epsilon y, and gamma xy is twice the readings from the middle one minus summation of these two. And when you're analyzing it, keep the signs as they are. Do not change the signs. So if it's minus 2060, keep it as minus 2060. Don't touch the values. So we have the three stress comp strain components. In order to find the stress components, we need constant equations. So the three constant equations, one for shear, two for normal values. So using these, the Young's modulus is given 70 gigapascals. 
Poisson ratio is 0.3. I showed you these three earlier. So if we can find the stress values. So what do we have to do after this? Based on slide number 15, we, for using those failure criteria, we need maximum principal stresses, sorry, maximum principal stress, maximum shear stress, and the form misses stress. Sometimes they call it equivalent stress, sometimes they call it effective stress. The same name is used in different places. Different, I mean, these names are used in different places. Any question on this, this slide? So first, I found the strain components at that location. Now I've got the stress values is in the constant equations. Now the next stage is to find maximum principal stress. So we have sigma x plus sigma y divided by 2 plus minus sigma x minus sigma y squared plus 4 to x y squared. Now when I'm using this equation, I keep the signs intact. So sigma x minus minus this value, it doesn't suddenly become positive. If I substitute these values in these two equations, we find the maximum principal stress of 61 and the minimum minus 2. Now my question is, if I had minus 61 and plus 2, which one would be the maximum principal stress? 61 megapascals is your maximum stress. It does not take it does not exceed sigma y, and so you do not fail in this category. No, I, I didn't ask the rest of it. But yeah, the first question was correct. So the sign is, if it was, say, minus 61 megapascals, thank you, you're very good. So the first one, minus 61 megapascals, the second one, 2 megapascals, say it was minus, then the maximum value, the absolute value is the principal, maximum principal stress. I've noticed that in exams, say they end up with students with minus 61 and 2, and they say 2 is the maximum principal stress, which is not correct. So the absolute value, I mean, just think about it. It doesn't matter if it's compression or tension, whichever is bigger is the maximum principal stress. So based on what I showed you, is the component is going to fail based on this criterion? The yield stress or safe stress is 100. Based on this uh, ranking or maximum principal stress theory, is it going to fail? No, that's it. So it doesn't fail, no failure. Now we move on to maximum shear stress. For maximum shear stress, I can find the difference between these two divided by two. So it's 61 minus minus two divided by two, or I can use this relation here. Oh, okay, I've used this one. Or I can say it's plus minus one over two square root of this two terms. And obviously it doesn't fail. What is sigma y over 2 is a maximum shear stress in simple tension. I showed you why it is sigma y over 2. So sigma 1 minus sigma 2 divided by 2 is less than sigma y over 2. So in that case it's plus minus 31.5 and it's not failing. The form misses or equivalent stress. I can either use this coordinate. I mean, this is the, uh, one of the students asked me. That's a very good question. If I use this coordinate system, you can see we've got sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. If I move on to one two coordinate system, then end up with sigma one squared minus sigma one sigma two plus sigma 2 squared, this, get, this will be eliminated, this will be cancelled out with one of the two C. So I've written at the moment in the XY coordinate system, I repeat, I can also write it in the equivalent, I mean one, two coordinate system, and you end up with sigma 1 squared minus sigma 1 sigma 2 plus sigma 2 squared. This the answer is the same. Does it fail? No. Very good. Doesn't fail. No failure. So what did we do here? We started with three strain measurements, and then we ended up with the stress values. First, we calculated the strain values. 
using the three constant equations. Then we calculated the same stre the stress components in that locations. Using these three, we calculated the maximum principal stress, the maximum shear stress, and the equivalent stress of four meters of stress. And then we compared them with the yield stress of the material. Any questions? And you have all these equations in your examination data sheets. I will upload it, uh, your own examination data sheet for you um, next week. Yes, please. I, I, as soon as you submit uh, your uh, coursework on Friday, I will upload a few more examination papers and your examination data sheets. Any other questions? Now, in question 6B, we have the same measurements, except the Rosette is different. C, obviously, it is the completely different example. They're not related at all. Say these three measurements are, have come from these three, these are three Rosettes. The first one is zero, the other two are 120 degrees with respect to each other. So could you please, I give you one minute to write down theta one, theta two, and theta three for these three gauges, please. The angle each gauge makes with the x-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. Theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. So how much is a theta one? If you know the answer, raise your hand, please. What is theta one, please? Very good, thank you. Can somebody else tell me what theta two is equal to? Theta two. Who said that? Okay, 120, very good. So how much is theta three equal to? Somebody else tell me what the answer is. Raise your hand, please, if you know. Theta 3. I don't show you the answer if, you tell, if you didn't, one person doesn't tell me. Go on. Theta 3 is equal to 240. Okay, that's good. So theta 1 is equal to 0. Theta 2 is equal to 120. And theta 3 is equal to 240. So this, this angle here. So theta one, I write just the equation once and substitute the values and this is what you should be doing in the exam. Don't write these three times and then substitute the values. It's just time consuming. Just once and then substitute the values, the three angles and from there, we get the three simultaneous equations, and we can find the three string components. This is slightly harder than the, the other one, because the other one was on the x-axis, so epsilon x was equal to epsilon m1. Now, if we've got the three string components, using the constant equations, we find the stress components, very similar to what we did earlier. Shall 
Should I move on? Okay, so the three stress components using the constitutive equations. Now we are after the three failure, I mean we are going to investigate whether it's going to fail or not. So we, and the yield stress is the same, 100 megapascals. So we've got, this is what we've done. So principal stresses. Does it fail? Does it fail? 70 maximum principal stress is 71.61 and the yield stress is 100. Fails or not? Okay. Doesn't fail. The maximum shear stress is the difference between these two divided by 2. And how much is the maximum shear stress in simple tension? Is it 100 or is it 50? Maximum shear stress in simple tension is sigma y divided by 2. So if the yield stress of the material is 100, the maximum shear stress in simple tension is 50. So we've got 35.27 and it's less than 50, so it doesn't fail. And the form misses the stress. So you can see in this um, problem, these two are very close. So this component should be most, mostly subject to normal stresses. You can see these are very similar. And the difference between these two, you can, and you can see the difference, I mean, the difference between these two is very, very small. I mean, uh, not a small, sorry. It means the minimum principal stress is relatively small. Yes, please. Um, does theta have to be in degrees? If it's, in, if it's given in radians, can we use radians or do we have to use It depends on your calculator because you're finding cosine of an angle, sine of an angle. In, cha in chapter 4, we, you used radians because the equations were written in terms of theta them itself. Here where you're having cosine of two theta, it doesn't matter. It depends on your, the setup of your calculator. That's a good question, doesn't me? But I usually use degrees. Yes, please. Um, um, like for exams, is there any like means that is going to work in like from like the end to like to to like the starting of it? Like for example, like the question is not asking whether it's failing or not, but they're giving all the value of like stress one, stress two, and like stress E and like two and two. Asking us, like, what's the angle of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At the moment, this two, yeah, yeah, that's a good. I don't know whether this is the question you're asking or not. I'll tell you what I think your question is, and you'll tell me yes or not. At the moment, we've got the strain measurements, and we are calculating whether it stresses or whether it is failing or not. There's a possibility you get a question, all right, we have these stress values. What are the strain values, or what? values each string gauge is going to register. Is this the question you're asking? Uh, we have the question asking like the angle and are we using, like for the answer, are we using radian or in degree? If they're asking for the angle of the string gauge. Okay, I mean, in this, I mean, um, I usually don't ask you to tell me what the angle is, but I, for this section, I usually use degrees rather than radians. I think it's more convenient because the setup of my calculator is usually degrees. I don't use radians because if I say 60 degrees, you understand it. Or if I say, well, if I say pi over 3 in, I don't think she'll understand it very well. No, I don't understand it very well. <laughs> so degrees, I think, is better, isn't it? Um, Yes, please. Any questions? I don't want to wait, but I don't want works if you know how to convert, right? Of course, of course, of course. You can either use either of them. Yeah, of course you can. Yes, yes. Uh, if one of the criteria fails, do we take it as a fail or? 
That is a very good question. As I said earlier, it depends on the material. Is it brittle? Is it doctoral? And the type of loads applied to it. As I said, in chapter two, we use ranking when we're comparing the uh, hoop stress with the yield stress of the material. Say in chapter two, when we're using Tresca. If we're using the Tresca, then you will, we should say sigma one minus sigma two should be less than sigma y. It means we will compare defining the difference between the two and comparing with the yield stress. So I say Tresca is not good for chapter two examples because you're comparing the difference between the two principal stresses with the yield stress, which is not good. For shear stress, for example, so that's the question you asked me, it depends on the application and it depends on the material and the loads applied. I will tell you which one. Usually I ask two of them. I ask, for example, Rankin and Formises, or Rankin and Tresca, or the, other, the last two. But I identify them. I thought you were talking about the application. You are talking, I... Like in the exam, are we like, oh. are we supposed to um, know um, which theory to use? Or like oh, no, 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 I'll t ask you. Definitely it's very unlikely I ask you all three of them. <coughs> I don't know. Let me today. It's very unlikely I ask all three of you, all three of them. I ask two of them usually. The, your paper is, has the same format as the ones I have had in the last three, four years, and I will upload some papers for you. Any more questions? So it is end of chapter six, but I'm going to solve more examples for you. So I covered all these slides, and these are the equations which are available to you in your examination data sheets. It's very the same as the ones you had last year, the students had last year. So these are the constant equations for Pinterest problems and how we can find the stresses, normal and shear on any plane passing through, on any plane passing through a point at an angle of theta. Principal stresses, maximum and minimum, their directions. Maximum and minimum shear stresses on their direction. And you can use either these two or these two equations. How to um, draw the Mohs diagram, the equation of the Mohs diagram. And then a strains on any plane passing through a point, any, on any plane passing through a point, principal planes. And the three equations for a strain rosette. And different criteria, ranking, Tresco, and four misses. Any questions? No questions, better to solve a few more examples before we run out of the tongue, run side. So question number two. In question number two, we've got an element on the upper surface of a wing. It carries compressive stress of 30 megapascals. So both of them are negative. And the problem is asking us to find the principal planes and principal stresses when it's asking us to find the principal planes, it means the directions. And the stresses on a plane whose normal is inclined at 30 degrees, as shown, I don't think I've shown it here. So it's quite straightforward. Here we've got sigma x, which is minus 30, sigma y, which is minus 30, and 2, which is equal to 10. Now, 2 here is a squared, so it doesn't matter, it's positive or negative for a two-dimensional problem because it is a squared, does not affect the solution. So I'm going to substitute the values. Both, it should be negative as well. So it's minus, this is minus as well. I keep the signs intact when I'm using these equations. So it's minus 30, minus 30 divided by two, 
minus 30 minus minus 30 squared plus 4 times 10 squared. So we have the maximum principal stress of minus 40 and the minimum principal stress of minus 20. So obviously, it's not, it's the absolute value which is important. And the directions, tangent to 2 theta n, 2 to x y, divided by sigma x minus sigma y is 90 degrees. So 2 theta n is 90 degrees. It means a theta n is equal to 45 degrees. And it's asking us to find on this plane, theta is 30 degrees. In this equation, it becomes 60 degrees. So this is the normal stress acting on the plane and the shear stress acting on the plane. Any question on this? This is a question for example. So as I said last week, if you understand the concept in this cha chapter, uh, there are loads of equations, but if you know what you're doing, and the analysis in terms, I mean, in terms of application is quite straightforward. It's much easier than the other chapters. So let's solve uh, another example. If you have questions, just raise your hand, please. So in question number four, I believe I solved uh, the part one, two, and I didn't draw the Morse diagram, and also I didn't do the failure part. So we are completing the, from whether the component fails according to the ranking theory, and if the yield stress is 100 megapascals, and also repeat the above using Morse circle, or Morse diagram. So this is what we did on last week. I mean, I showed you the solution, analytical solution. So we've got a thin walled cylinder with the internal pressure of P, which is subject to a torque of T. And the inspection points are these three points. So we, I showed you the, if I look at one of the elements, Capital X, capital Y is attached to the cross section. Little x, little y is attached to each of those small elements. So X is the same direction of, as the Z axis or the ax, main axis of the cylinder. So sigma X of each element. So if I show you, if I have an element here. So this is sigma X for element. This is sigma y, little y, and shear stress. I saw a few examples for you on Friday as well. So here we've got sigma x, which is equal to the same direction of z. So we've got sigma x, which is axial stress, PD over 40. Sigma y is in the same direction of Sigma y is in the same direction of the hoop stress or circumferential direction, 75. The shear stress is TR over J. J is the polar second moment of area. This is the approximate value, and this is the exact value. And I'll show you how to find the normal stress, normal stress and shear stress on a plane whose normal makes angle 40 degrees using these two equations. I showed you how to find principal stresses and maximum and minimum principal stress. These are the maximum and minimum principal stresses. That is the orientation of the principal plane and maximum and minimum shear stresses and the orientation of it. 
So the angle between these two must be 45 degrees. So we're going to repeat it using Mohs diagram now. Actually, this is not the one. I'll show you this one and then i show you the other slide. So we're going to repeat it using Mohs diagram. So we've got a normal stress of 37.5 and a shear stress of 30.55. We've got a normal stress of 75 and a shear stress of 30.55. I join the two points. Where they intersect this x-axis, this is the center of the circle. Now I take a compass and draw a circle. This is the maximum principal stress, and this is the minimum principal stress. They have no shear components. The maximum and minimum shear stresses, this is the maximum SS coordinate we could have on the circle. Now here, this is the x-axis, and it rotates for 120, so 20 times 120 degrees. So here, the, on the Mohs diagram, we have 120. On the physical element, it should rotate for 60 degrees. The problem is asking us to find the stresses on a plane whose normal mixed angle of 40 degrees with the x-axis on the physical element. 40 multiplied by 2 gives us 80 degrees. So from here, I rotate it anti-clockwise for 80 degrees. And these are what I showed you earlier, 83 and minus 24. So it means if I want on the physical element, this is 40, so this is how it looks like. So this is... So here I rotate it for 80 degrees. So if I rotate the element, say it is x prime, and this is y prime. So this is x prime here. This is y prime. And this is 40 degrees. Question? Okay. So this is at the moment 120 degrees, so this is 40 degrees, so it should be 60. So say I want, I'm after this axis, this coordinate. So say this is 1 and this is 2 axis. So here it is 40 degrees. If I use a different color, Then this is x double prime, oh no, sorry, it is 1, this is 2. This is 40 degrees, and this is 60 degrees. So this is the principal direction, this is 60. Which is this angle here. You can see we are rotating it anti-clockwise for 120 to reach the principal plane. So this must be 1, this must be 2. So I just use the same color here. This is 1, this is 2. So this is 60 degrees here. So this is 1, 2. This is 1, 2 here. So the angle between two planes, this is very important. If you draw a Mohs diagram, the angle between two planes on the Mohs diagram is twice the angle between the two planes on the physical element. Any question on this slide? No. Let's solve this example for you as well. You have enough time. So say a question for we were asked to find the strain values. 
this is not in the description. Say if we were told to find the string component at this point. So we use the three cost of equations to find the string values. Now, one of the examples from past examination paper, I said, say if I attach a three 45 degree string with Z at this location, what value each of these gauges is going to register? So this is other way around. The example I showed you, question 6A and 6B, you had the strain measurements and then you calculated the stress values. So this is just in reverse order. We have the strain values. Now we want to know if I do the experiment in the lab, which, what value each of these gauges is going to give us. So I'm using this equation. It's quite straightforward now. So we've got epsilon m1 using this relation. This is equal to epsilon x, epsilon m2. So this is 45. It becomes 90 degrees. And how much is this angle th theta 3? Is it 45 or 90? How much is th theta 3 equal to for this case? 45 or 90? Very good. So, so this is the answer. I think last year I asked the students, I gave them 120 degrees of strain reserve. Once they did the analysis, I asked them to tell me what the strain gauges one and two register. And majority did correctly. It's now 12 minutes to 12. I think we have enough time for another example. I have got more examples from this chapter. I'll solve it for you next Friday, next Monday. Any questions? Thank you, and thank please. Thank you Oh, thank you. So please submit your coursework by 6 p.m. on Friday. Thank you.